Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about the values of our country and the importance of flags. I'm excited to welcome special guest Devon Super, otherwise known as Professor Flag. Devon is a vexillologist who owns one of the largest private flag collections in the state of Utah. He has devoted his life to studying and promoting the values that the flag of the United States of America represents, and he practices what he preaches. His list of awards for volunteer and community service are too numerous to mention. Devon, thank you so much for joining with me today. Thanks for having me. This is going to be fun. I am so excited. So, Professor, you've already taught me a new vocabulary word, vexillology. It's the kind of word where if someone says it, it seems like the proper response is gesundheit. Uh, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Vexillology is a relatively new term. It was uh, coined by Whitney Smith, who was kind of the father of vexillology. And Latin, it breaks down to vexil, which is flag in Latin, and ology, study of. So, study so it makes of perfect sense if you know Latin, but exactly, I don't. So, But what it gets down to is it's a, a kind of a hobby science breakdown. Most people kind of equate it to a combination of anthropology, sociology, and heraldry all mashed into one. Whoa, okay, expound. Because flags represent people. They represent a group of people. And every group of people that gets together at one point or another will either A, develop a flag, have had a flag, or is getting a flag because they need some physical representation of them. So, for example, uh, you have members of the, of the LGBTQ community. Right. There's they a whole a bunch whole, of flags. There are 37 of them. Seriously? For the LGBTQ community. Wow. And their flags, they, they fly them with absolute pride. And those flags are recognizable. You can immediately know who they represent and what they stand for just by the design of their flag. If you know all 37 different if, branches. If, if you, know, you know that community, but they all, they all wear those, they all fly those with, with pride. In fact, all through June is, is Pride Month all over the country. And you'll see those rainbow flags everywhere. Wow, that's really cool. Well talking about different flags for, for groups, and there's also flags for countries, and I know that that's something that you specialize in. And you have taught so many groups. I think your talks, we said, are in the thousands now. Just about, yeah. So scout groups and youth groups and school groups and... Family reunions. I've done primary classes I've done uh, for, for the LDS faith. I've done classes for the Lutheran Church. I've done... Uh, Military groups, police groups, fire groups, all ages. In fact, I got my nickname, Professor Flag, from teaching a group at the Zion Summit Community just behind the uh, conference center. Which I is think where it's a good name. <laughs> they're like, you need something that will get people in the door. It's a, just a flag discussion. You, it's, it's boring. It sounds boring. It sounds boring. We're going to come talk about the flag, and it's 13 stripes, and it has 50 stars, and that represents the 50 states. and the 30. No. We have fun with it. That makes all the difference. So my husband, Lois, he was talking about listening to one of your presentations, and he came back just glowing and bouncing and wanting to share with me all the fun things he learned. And his favorite part was what you talked about, Captain America. Exactly. Captain America's uniform, if you look at it, the red classic red and white stripes down the front, the big old white star in the middle, and it usually has the shoulders that come down to a V right about the mid middle of the chest. For those of us that are in the know, that's actually the flag of Puerto Rico that he's sporting on his uniform. <laughs> so Captain America's is really actually Captain, Captain Puerto Rico. Rico. <laughs> that's his old uniform. That's right? his old. In, in the new uniform, in the new one, he there. kind of goes between Captain Cuba and Captain Puerto Rico, depending <laughs> on which, okay. which uniform he has. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> they should have uh, brought you in back when they were... Of course, you probably weren't born when that was I invented. wasn't born when that was invented. Okay, so tell us some of the awesome, fun things that you share to make it fun, besides Captain America slash the, Captain Puerto Rico. The first thing that we have to talk about is why, why flags were invented in the first place. And so you have to think about, throughout history, the first flags were the Vikings and, and the Egyptians, and they used those to identify the royals, or 
military units and those types of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, you also think about the peasants and, and the, the people that couldn't read. And a lot of your, your merchants couldn't speak multiple languages. So as of crossing borders throughout the Middle Ages, and you've got merchants going from kingdom to kingdom to kingdom, and they may not speak the same language, the only way you really know where you're at and which laws you're referring to it may not be a signpost. It's going to be the flag that's flying on the, on the castle or that's flying from the main entrance where the, the, the guards are. The other thing that uh, gets fun about that is your family crests and heraldry. That all goes back to the knights and, and jousting tournaments, and they would take their family crest, their personal uh, crest and put that on a flag so you knew what team to cheer for. And I kind of joke and imagine watching a football game where both teams wore white. Oh, that could be a challenge. Yes, that's where flags and and you know, you know thinking of the, the knights and things that they're solid metal armor. You couldn't really tell which one is which. So they've got their horses decked out in their in their colors, and they've got their flag flying on either side of the of the jousting tournament. So you knew which knight to cheer for. So it comes into sporting events and those types of things. So that's where we, we get a lot, started a lot, a lot of the fun. And then we talk about our history. Like the flag was actually first and foremost a weapon. A weapon? It's a weapon. Flags were attached to what was called a pole arm. So if you look at a lot of flags, they've got the, the eagle or a ball or a spear point on top, the, the finial, the decorated piece right. on top. Back in the 16th, 17th, and 1800s, that was actually a critical defense weapon because the flag was always carried on the front line. That's how you knew where the front line was, and that flag always led the charge out. If you can imagine carrying this nine-foot pole with this heavy cotton or wool flag, you couldn't exactly do a Kentucky long rifle, uh, musket balls and all that stuff, and carry the flag at the same time. So you've got this sharp spear on the end of it that if they had to do a charge, that flag could be used to take out the enemy. Oh, that's helpful. Otherwise, if you're the flag bearer, you're also vulnerable. You are are a target because one of the rules, and just like capture the flag, if your flag is captured or if it's intentionally laid down, you have lost that battle. Oh, not good. And so you'd have a whole unit, a color guard, whose sole job was to make sure that that flag stayed up. That's what color That's guard, where the comes, color guard from? comes from? Oh my gosh, I only see it in like high school where they twirl stuff. And they were originally escorting with the band, and the band was a communication tool because you've got the bugle calls to sound the morning, evening colors, reveille, charge, all of those. And then you have the military color guards that you see today where you have a, a rifle on either side that goes back to that that time frame when the flag was always protected by a color guard. It was always under a an armed escort. That makes perfect sense. And when I teach scouts that, they're like, oh, they, they sit right up. They're like, okay, now I understand why this whole flag ceremony thing they do at the beginning of their scout presentations matters. Why do we have to have so many people as part of this, this ceremony just go up, put the flag into place? And no, you're actually paying respects to those soldiers who protected that flag and keep that escort. Wow. Yeah, that does. It makes something, since we're doing something symbolically at this point, it's really, really helpful to go back to what we are symbolizing. Exactly. And a lot of our traditions have gotten lost that same way. Most people don't realize that there's three different sets of rules that manage how the flag etiquette works. You have a civilian set, which is called the Flag Code, which is written into Title IV of the U.S. Code, Title 36 and Title 18. There's a specific set of rules of what you can and can't do with the flag of the U.S. There's a military set, which dictates dimensions and all that such for military units and how they proceed with the flag, what they use it for, when to display it, when not to display it. And each branch of the military has their own little nuances and how they they work with the flag. And then the third set is the international set, because when you have international flags together, all the rules change because you can't have one nation over another. They should all be at equal heights. And there's a bunch of crazy rules that go in with that. So what happens is you have 
these rules, and you have these rules, and you have the, the civilian, the military, and all these international rules, they all get jammed together, and people have a complete misunderstanding of what's happening. My favorite thing to correct here in Utah is when you have missionary families going out, and they're so proud of their missionary that they put the U.S. flag, and they put the country of the, of the missionary right below it, and I'm like, no, you can't do that. You have, can't fly international flags from the same flagpole. They have to be completely separate because you can't have one flag over another because that indicates dominance. That indicates that that country is inferior to the flag that's below. Wow, I so, had no idea. Yeah, all the symbolism that goes into it, it's kind of crazy. In fact, I kind of make my neighbors cringe a little bit because of how many flags I can display on my front yard. And, and that bothers them? Some of them are called Called the cops about flying flags. They said I have too many. It's it's intimidating. Oh my land! That, that <laughs> makes no sense whatsoever. It's time for some new neighbors. So, what flags are you flying? One year, I did all fifty state flags and seven territories. Your yard is not big enough for that. Where on earth did they go? They went right in front of my driveway, right from the edge of the driveway, uh, from the north on the east side all the way across the garage front door up to my front door, and I had them six inches apart. Six inches apart. Wow. Okay, so what was the special occasion that you put all 50 flags? Was it Flag Day, or was it? Fourth of July. It was the Fourth of July, and so you put up all 50 flags. For Flag Day, I put up 37, uh, which is all the U.S. flags that we've had from 1775 all the way to now. All right, time to call the cops. Just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so when you can't put one above the other, can you put the nation flag above the state flag? Yes. Okay, so that, that is okay. okay. And you can, when you have multiple poles, uh, like four or five, you know, you've got sporting events where you've got three poles all together. All the flag poles are at the same height. The flag code on the civilian side says that flags cannot fly higher than or to the right of the U.S. flag. So you should fly all the flags at the same height with the U.S. flag on its own right. So it goes... For facing which direction? So if you're... Depending on the intended... Uh, like the audience? The intended direction? view. Exactly. Intended view. Okay, okay, okay. So like if you've got a store, you've got three flagpoles in the front, it's intended to be viewed from the street. Okay. So you'd have... Viewed from the street on... Looking at the flagpole, you'd have the U.S. on the left, which would be its own right, if you think of it as its own person. Okay, right. So the, the other flags would be like to the right of the... Correct. Okay, okay. All right. Okay, now that is something that I have never known before. So if I did it wrong, what would the consequences be? Up until 1986, the penalty for flag desecration or violating the flag code would have been $1,000 and up to six months in jail. Wow. However, in 1986, there was a landmark Supreme Court case, Texas v. Johnson, and that was a case where Johnson was participating in a protest, and he burned the flag in protest, and Texas arrested him for flag desecration and public safety issues, and he was charged and convicted for flag desecration, and he took that all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court held that burning the flag in protest is protected under the First Amendment. So basically, that pretty much turned, as as Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean says, they're pretty much, they're more like guidelines now. Okay, so the flag code is more like guidelines. Correct. It's still written into law. There are still, quote-unquote, penalties attached, but it's not technically forcible because of how it's protected. Well, I... I, I love the flag. I want to honor it. I think desecrating is not okay. Putting putting it, the, the flags in the wrong order, which is something I'm completely ignorant of, thinking of that as flag desecration is actually kind of like, oh, oops. Um, but you also have to look at it as intent. I mean, if you're putting the flags out to display, even if you don't know the proper order, you're not maliciously going out and saying, I'm going to go put the U.S. flag in and, and intentionally disgrace it. No. Right. So obviously the intent behind it which is where myself and my friends from Vexillology come in, that we want to teach you how to do that. We want to show you how how these get displayed and how they all work together and the relationship that they all have. So the, the intent there, obviously you're not intending to purposely de- desecrate the flag. 
which is funny because most people also don't realize that the flag code says that, according to the, the first section, it says anything that, it, regardless of media or how it's represented, how it's manufactured, if it looks like a flag of the United States, it is a flag of the United States. That means everything from those little itty bitty flags that you get on the cupcakes at Fourth of July, to ever to the giant flags that you see put on the field at uh, the football games. Okay, so the little cupcake, the little cupcake flags little that are about two inches by one on inch. On the toothpick thing, it is a flag of the United States. So do I have to retire that flag and burn it? Because I'm afraid I have just thrown them in the garbage. Most people have. Technically, that is a flag of the United States and should be taken care of just like any other flag of the United States. Wow. The flag Crazy code flag. also says that you shouldn't be putting it on anything that's easily discarded, like napkins, paper plates, things like that, because it, it's meant to be a flag, not a, a novelty item. But and I'm afraid our flag has very much become a novelty item. It is very item. much so. In fact, we are the only country, one of the very few countries, I should say, shouldn't say only, a lot of countries look at us and say, you guys are crazy because you have your American flag over everything. And it, we view it as disrespectful because we've got it on t-shirts and we've got it in pants and we've got it on right. unmentionables and swimming suits and everywhere. But if you display that flag wrong, people get really crazy. Really? Yeah. So that can be offensive. And some people, when they're doing it, they're trying to be respectful. Trying like, to be patriotic. And, and other people, when they're doing it, it, it doesn't really mean anything to them. It's just a pattern, decoration, whatever. It also says the flag should never be worn as clothing. Yes. And the popular thing during the Olympics that you're going to see coming up in Tokyo is when they run the track, they run that foot with the flag around their shoulders and they parade it around like they wear it like a cape. Flag code says you can't do that. Do all the nations do that? Some, some nations, idea. depending on the country, because there are some nations out there that have a very strict flag code that carries a death penalty. Whoa. Because on, on some of the flags is written the name of Allah. Uh, and by desecrating the flag, you're thereby committing heresy, and then that's a whole different... I hope they know their flag code better than we know our flag code, because if it's a death penalty, that matters. That matters. In fact, um, uh, just a few years ago, Miley Cyrus did a concert in Mexico. And Mexico has a very, very proud uh, flag tradition. And she brought out the flag and was dancing with it, trying, you know, thinking that she was being, you know, patriotic with, with Mexico and getting them uh, really excited. Honoring them. Honoring right. them. And, and, and instead she was offending them. She was offending them. She was actually arrested. Oh. She was arrested and they had to come to some agreements about some education for her, but she got in some big trouble for that. Wow. Okay. Some different consequences. Well, I wish we understood our code better. It sounds so complicated when there's three different levels and and, and all these things and flags at half mast. It's like they, they don't ever get back to the top again. That's that's the interesting thing that we, we see lately. I, where I work at Colonial Flag, I've actually had people call in and ask if we have yo-yo attachments because the flag goes up and down so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that is very appropriate. Okay, but, but the thing that people don't again, don't understand, is that when the president issues a proclamation ordering the flags to have staff, if you read it very carefully, it says on all federal buildings and all military bases and all federal properties around the country and embassies around the world. That implies it's specifically directed to those, those entities. So your personal flag, you don't necessarily have to lower it to have staff when the president says to lower it to have staff. All the flags in federal buildings will be lowered to have staff, but you don't necessarily have to on your okay. own. There's no penalty if you don't. That's interesting. So it seems to me like they're half-masked a lot. I'm assuming that not all of those have come from a presidential decree. All of the ones lately, yes. Those all come to, they all come from a presidential or governor. Because the governors of the states, the mayor of, of Washington, D.C., all have the authority to lower the flag to half staff for various reasons. The flag code has very specific criteria that it does spell out of death of a president, death of a vice president, death of a senator, death of you know, public officials, whether they're sitting or former, very specific over how long they should fly at half staff and, and for when. I was going to ask that next. How long is it supposed to be? 
So for a sitting member of the House of Representatives, it's the day of death and the day, the day following. That's it. You can also lower it on the day of internment, uh, which recently we had a situation where the internment is not going to be until September. So obviously oh. we're not going to fly the flag the entire half staff all the way through. So we flew it at half staff for three days here. And then when he's the day of his funeral in September, they'll, they'll fly it again at half staff then. So for presidents, it's 30 days, whether they're current or former. For vice presidents, current or former, it's 10. For the chief justice of the Supreme Court, it's 10. For an associate justice of the Supreme Court, it's the day of death to the day of internment. And the same for the rest of them, Speaker of the House, from the day of the death to the day of internment. Okay. So, like grocery stores and all the people that are doing their flags, do they know how long they're supposed to stay down? Because it just seems like they're down a lot. They are. Um, For national tragedies, like they've been doing for the shootings and and massacres across the country, the president is very specific when he gives the date, you know, from this day to this day, from sunup to sundown. Okay. And he's varied everything from four, uh, three, four days to a full week to up to ten days. I mean, there's no really way of knowing what the president has in mind. Unfortunately, a lot of politicians like to take that and use it as a political talking point and a physical reminder of the political situation going on, which is completely inappropriate, but it happens. Right. Okay. So now we're getting close to Memorial Day and Flag Day. So I have a couple questions about that. If you want to explain what those are. And then also, like, if you have a a flag over the casket, like your grandpa or something, then what do you do with that flag? What do you do with it? Exactly. So Memorial Day is one of several days that was originally designed to honor military. And those go, you have Armed Forces Day, which we just had in May. Uh, earlier in May, those represent those that celebrates those who are currently serving. Memorial Day is for those who have died. And we honor those who have passed away either in service or after their service. Um, and then we go on to uh, Veterans Day, which is designed, which was to pay tribute to those who have served. So you have Armed Forces for who are serving, Veterans Day who have served, and Memorial Day for who have passed away. Okay. So on mem- Armed Forces, or on uh, November 11th, Veterans Day, the flag is flying at full staff. On Armed Forces Day, the flag flies at full staff. On Memorial Day, it flies at half staff until noon. Oh, interesting. And then at noon, it's raised up to full staff. Fascinating. And then Flag Day, which is my favorite holiday. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, is also the Army's birthday. And so it's a double flag. They call it a double holiday. But uh, flags are flown at full staff. And that's been happening since uh, Flag Day really got official around 1920, but we've been celebrating this since 1775. That's a long time. Did we have a flag in 1775? We did. The flag that we had in 1775, and I'm, the, the joys of audio, our cancer, the, our Starfield actually had the British Union Jack in the corner. Oh, we well, had, that makes sense. When we started out on this little adventure we call independence, we really didn't want independence. We actually wanted equal representation in Parliament, and we wanted to be heard by the by the Crown. Okay. So on January 1st, 1775, General George Washington raised what's called the Grand Union Flag on Prospect Hill in what is now Massachusetts. And this flag served from 1775 all the way to June 14th, 1777. Because halfway through there, about 1776, we sent our little love letter to King George. <laughs> Yeah, he didn't like that. And we decided that it was probably not a good idea to have our former country's flag on our flag. Right. Which you'll see a lot with Commonwealth of the United Kingdom nowadays. Like yes, Australia. Uh-huh. This follows that same pattern of having the, the, the crown's flag of the corner canton, like you'd see with Australia, New Zealand, other places like that. Uh, a lot of the, the Caribbean islands still have the British flag up in the corner. Right. Uh, Canada had it up there until 1960 when they changed the, the maple leaf. So we were following that precedent. So okay, so let's describe it since they can't so see it. So this one has what's called the King's Colors, which is a uh, a blue field with a red cross, St. George's cross down the uh, center. So it, 
down the red line down the middle and across the center. And then you have a white X going from corner to corner, uh, representing Scotland. And then you have later they added a red X going through the middle of the white X to represent Northern Ireland. Okay. So at this point, Ireland wasn't a part of the equation, so you had the flags of England and Scotland combined to make what's called the King's Colors up until 1808. Wow. Fascinating. And then that is added to, that's where the stars are now, and that's added to 13 stripes, right. representing the 13 colonies we have. So for me, as just a layman who does not know all the pieces parts, it looks very much like the current American flag with your red and white stripes, but in the spot where there's blue and the white stars should be, it looks kind of like a Union Jack yep. sort of a thing. Exactly what it is, just a little older. Right. And then on... Uh, June 14th, 1777, they decided that they probably uh, ought to get rid of that. And so they decided that the flag of the United States shall be 13 stripes, alternating red and white, with 13 stars in a field of blue. That was it. How many ways do you think you can draw that pattern? A lot. So the 13 stars didn't have to be in the circle like they We didn't have to it. be in the circle. In fact, they didn't even have to be five-pointed stars. Oh, we even had some that were 13, or that had six points. We had some that were 12 points. We had some that were 10 points. We even had one, and I brought this one, and I'll describe it a little bit more. But you take the stars, and you completely invert the flag. So where the stripes should be is where the stars are, and where the stars should be is where the stripes are. Whoa. Okay, hold on. Okay, so now describe what that, okay, this is so bizarre. this flag oh, I wish I could show is you from picture. Eastern Pennsylvania. It's called the Easton flag, and the, the, the flag where the stripes should be is uh, 12 stars in a circle around a central star, and these are eight pointed stars. Yeah. Look and like something you could quilt. Exactly. And up in, the, up in the corner where the stars should be, you actually have your 13 stripes. And so this fits the description of 13 stripes, red and white, alternated, field of blue, with 13 thir stars. Wow. Wow. I have never, ever thought that that could be interpreted any way besides the little Betsy Ross flag, flag that, you know, we've all seen. So, And, and here's, we're going to blow a little bit more hole into the education of the United States. Oh my gosh. <laughs> my mind is blown. Okay. Betsy Ross didn't make the first one. Dang it. Okay, she so made, teach she me made, what really happened. So it was designed by committee, and it was originally designed to have six pointed stars. Now, women like Betsy Ross, she made lots of flags for George Washington, and it did have a significant part in making flags, and she's famous for that particular design. She just has some very loving grandchildren who found her stuff years later, and they just went with the story of Grandma made the first flag, and no one questioned it. But there's no historical evidence, no documentation, nothing to support that she made the very first flag. Okay, but she was one of the people who made the first flag with the 13 stripes. Exactly. And exactly. 13 she's, credited, stars. she's credited with creating what the, the five-pointed star, because making a five-pointed star out of fabric and getting it the same, the same shape every single time is a lot easier with a five-pointed than it is with any other shape because of the way you fold the fabric. And then with one slice of the scissors, you get the same shape every single time. And that's very important because you want that... That symmetry. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. And then the flag evolved even more as we got more and more states. They decided they were going to add a star and a stripe for every new state that came on board. And I'm glad they stopped or else it will almost look pink with the little red and white exactly. itsy bitsy things. Imagine these little pink seals on the Boy Scout uniforms on the shoulder. <laughs> It looked like a pinstripe suit. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> but they stopped in 1820 is when they went back to 13 stripes. Okay. And how many did we have? I knew we had, I made it up to 15. Right? We got to 15, okay. and that one took us through uh, Kentucky, and that was the flag that inspired Francis Scott Key's Star Spangled. That was a flag that was 33 feet high, 42 feet long, and took 11 men to hoist it up the flagpole every day. It um, weighed 55 pounds. And that thing is, is massive. And one of the stories that comes around that particular flag is the heroics of the, of the bodies that piled up at the bottom of the flagpole holding that flag in place. The problem with that is if you think about a flag that size, 
if you look at the flags around the Valley of Salt Lake, you've got these big old giant flags on the flagpoles of car dealerships and at grocery stores. Those flags are 30 feet by 60 feet. So if you think about this flag, it's 33 feet by 42 feet. That's a giant sail. Any kind of a wind, it would be the soldiers going over the ramparts, not the bombs. <laughs> okay, so what really happened? So what really happened is they switched it from that flag to a storm flag, which is just a, a little bit smaller during the evening. And that night, there was a, a nor'easter, which is a, a major storm coming through. So as the bombs are coming off of the ships and in the harbor, you've got these massive winds coming down. And so this flag is flying straight out the whole night. And obviously, Francis Scott Key from the deck of the ship, where he was originally there to negotiate prisoner exchange. Right. They held him on board because he overheard the plans to attack the fort. All through the night, he's watching these the, the whole thing go, go down because this is just a few months prior. They burned Washington, D.C. to the ground. Mm -hmm. So this is a, kind of like the last ditch effort. If we lose this one, the United yeah. States, we're going back to God save the Queen. Mm -hmm. So all night, he's watching and the bombs bursting in air, the rockets red glare watching that flag there because we talked about earlier if the flag is gone if the flag is captured they've lost the battle and so he watching that all night long and the miracle of that is they hit the magazine room where all the ammunition was stored which is about the size of the kitchen room okay packed full of the gills barrels of black powder they hit it four times never went off Whoa, so the British hit the... They, they hit that room, they hit that area four times, and none of those bombs went off. Wow. So after that fourth one, they moved all the crap, they scattered it around the fort a little bit better so that, that if it did go off, it would make a huge crater. It, it would have been devastating. Right. So that next morning, Francis Scott, he looked out, there was mist on the harbor, and through the mist of the deep, he saw the flag, and the flag was still there. And he penned what is called the, def the defense of Fort McHenry. And there are five verses to that song. Of which we know one pretty good. And, and I know with my children, I'm not sure if yours, I, I remember I was your boy scout leader for a little while. Mm -hmm. And I remember Samuel particularly would come up, ask a question, and never wait around for the answer. Oh, um, yeah, that's my boy. <laughs> that is exactly what we're doing every single time we sing the first, the, the first, the first verse of the Star Spangled Banner. It ends in a question mark. Right. And we leave it at a question mark and we're satisfied with it. And the funny thing is, it's, is our flag still there? Play ball. Right. Right. But the answer comes in the fifth verse. It says, when our land is illumined with liberty's smile, if a foe from within strikes a blow to her glory, down, down with the traitors that dare to defile the flag of her stars and the page of her story. By the millions unchained who our birthright have gained, we will keep her bright blazing forever unstained, and the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Oh, that's putting a little lump in my throat here. That particular verse was <sighs> added in 1865 after the Civil War. Really? The sad part about the, the our beautiful star-spangled banner is and you can correct me again if I'm wrong because what I learned I learned in school mm -hmm. but we were taught in high school that it was it was written as a poem mm -hmm. but then when it was shared it was shared in in the pubs in the bars and so you, they put it to a song a tune that was already in place and my history teacher kind of laughed and said because you got to be drunk to hit those notes you know it's an octave and a half. It, it's yeah, it's huge, really huge high, range. so it would be lovely if we could have that beautiful poem to a song that we could reach the notes. Yeah, um, you can thank Ripley's Believe It or Not for for endearing this so much to us because in 1931 or 1929, yeah, 1929, Robert L. Ripley put in his famous uh, article of Believe It or Not, the U.S. flag, the U.S. Uh, United States of America does not have a national anthem. What? Our national anthem was not our national anthem until 1933. 1933. Up until then, the military would use it for formal events. They would also use Hail Columbia, which is what we what they play for the vice president now. Um, they would play other patriotic hymns, but we never had an official, this is the national anthem for the United States until 1933. 
Ripley's believed or not. So they went back. Well, then how come we don't have a better tune? Because they pulled a poem from the War of 1812, and the song, I mean, was well, chosen the song in 1833. Chosen, well, they actually carried them up right from the very beginning. So that was a very popular patriotic song all the way through to 1933. Okay, so it had it, become a unit long before it exactly. became the national anthem. Exactly. It's a lot, okay. a lot like the songs we have now, like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, how many other songs go to that same tune the alphabet exactly <laughs> or yankee doodle dandy kids have been making up all kinds of songs to go with that it's right like same kind of same kind of idea um but in 1933 they went before the legislative section that when at the time we had just come out of world war one we were heading things were getting really crazy over in europe about that same time we had just gone through the stock market crash of 29 things were pretty dire and that poem, that very first verse, struck a chord with everybody of, if the flag's still there, we're going to be okay. Wow. And here we are, almost 100 years later, that flag isn't always there. I mean, there are many campuses who have forgotten that part of history. They've forgotten what that flag means to so many veterans and, and, and Americans across the globe. and. I recognize that there are some, you know, we've had our faults all throughout history. We, we're not a perfect people. And to some, that does represent some oppression, and it does represent some imperialism and some other crazy things that have happened. However, when you talk to people who are immigrating to this country and what that flag means to them and what the, the, the freedom it represents and the people that it represents, they get all choked up just like every other patriot out there. And so to remove it from academic places because it's considered oppressive or, or hateful, in my view, you've missed the point of the flag entirely. Absolutely. So I think while we're having these conversations of, of racial equality and, and civil discord and bringing civics back into classrooms and all that stuff, my goal in teaching them about the flag history of, of the flag and how we got here is to remind people of what this thing really represents why why even worry about a piece of fabric you know what does it matter i mean it's just a piece of cloth right no no um going to your question of the casket flag that flag is a flag of the united states it's provided by the government as a token of thank you gratitude for the person who had passed away a lot of my collection, one of my favorite flags I have is a 48-star flag that I had gotten from a scouting event. My family brought it to me and said, this is an old flag. It needs to be decommissioned, retired. It's just old. I opened it up. It's a pristine condition flag from 1955. It's a 48-star, sewn, hand-sewn stars. The grommets on it are still lead, lead anchors from the time they were using that type of, of an attachment. And on the header was a serial number, so we could trace where that flag came from. It came from a supply depot in Fort Lee, Virginia, where my grandpa happened to be Graves Registration Officer. Wow. So my grandpa Fife actually handled that particular flag. Really? But they brought it to me not knowing the history behind it. They had absolutely no idea what it was. And so my plea now, is when I go to senior citizens' homes and, or, and those type of events, is to get them to write down their stories. What did they experience? And how did they get to this point having that flag draped coffin? Because most you know, two or three generations down the road, they have absolutely no idea what Grandpa went through. Right. I mean, I know these, these memories are traumatic. I know that battle war is hell. That there's no other way for it. Right. But... People in my generation, I mean, both of my grandparents were, were in the military. I didn't find out about what they did until after they passed away. Oh, really? I mean, they were very tight-lipped. They didn't want to talk about it. And that's such a natural response to not want to talk about it. But the sad thing is then the future generations don't know, don't understand, and don't appreciate what took place. Exactly. 
And so the flags that are that are on the casket, they're, they're folded up and they're presented to the next of kin, whether it's the, the widow or the oldest child or whomever. Like for my granddad, we actually had we had one flag that was on the casket that they folded on site. And we had nine other flags. So each each kid got a flag. Cool. Um, and my grandpa also served in the Canadian government and was entitled to a Canadian flag where my uncle was adopted. And so we presented my uncle with a flag from Canada. Oh, that's special. So it's those types of memories that make those flags even more special. And so I encourage them all to write down their memories of granddad so that when those flags are passed on, they don't end up in my collection because they have absolutely no idea what's going on. Right. And those flags, they are still flags of the United States. Fly them. Don't leave them locked up. In a, I mean, a nice presentation case, fantastic. Those are beautiful. But let them fly. Take them out. Fly them on their birthday. Fly them on Veterans Day. Fly them on those special holidays and, and make that even more of a memory so that they're, that's even more present. And that's the message that I take to the senior citizen centers is to make sure your kids and grandkids know what you did. Even if you were just a cook on the front line, make sure you know. Wow, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for being here, Devon. You are amazing. And I know you could go on and on. There's so much more you could share. We may have to do this again. And you're welcome to, to check out my Facebook page, Professor Fly, right on Facebook. If you have questions, any protocol etiquette questions, everything from what's the fringe on the flag for to how do I display this thing, send me a message and I'll, I'll respond. Perfect. I'll make sure also to include that in the description now. Thank you. Thank you. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Ronald Reagan. He said, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. I want to thank Devon Simper for doing his part to ensure that this does not happen. And I invite you to do yours. See you next time on Linda's Corner.